Okay, in this quick video clip, I just want to show real quick the uh, padded anvil flaking method. Uh, I'm using elongated hammer stones, longer than normal ha hammer stones, which allow for a, a swing to be carried out similar to uh, a billet swing. So you have an arcing tra trajectory, and as opposed to a straight tra trajectory. Uh, it's as though we're using this as a billet. Uh, with the, we're not uh, driving long. We have an arcing swing. Okay, so this is a pad of uh, cloth, uh, mock-up buckskin. This is a stump, just a flat stump. So this pad's probably about two inches thick. Okay, so this is pretty high quality roll stone. It's probably weighs still 15 pounds or so. Okay, here's an example of a uh, removal. You can see how thin this removal is. And uh, th this hammer stone would qualify, I think, as a soft, uh, a soft hammer stone due to the cortex on the exterior. Okay, so here's another flake removed. This is kolha. This is actually a translucent material. You find it on the rinds of some of these nodules. Okay, so here's another flake just removed. Okay. Nice, nice piece of kolha there. Okay. So this uh, padded anvil method um, is actually useful in a number of scenarios in both uh, percussion and indirect percussion. And so I think what's going on here is that this pad allows for the brake to continue to run uh, over the surface of the stone. It doesn't. It doesn't really cause the uh, uh, the the brake to stop or to hinge. Um, there's a lot of theories about why that works. You know, some say that uh, it you have a diffuse the the padding diffuses the diffuses the uh, the, the surface uh, pressure points and you know um, so anyway regardless of how it works uh, this give you an idea of some of the spalls that can be removed and if you have a flat stone probably you could carry out a preform well you can carry out a preform reduction uh, with this method so basically uh, it's an important to hold to hold the stone steady on the on the anvil and also to leave some overhang. Uh, so I think of this actually as over the margin flaking. This goes that that actually that concept goes back to uh, Cushing. Well, we'd say 1895 for sure on over the margin, but actually, depending on how you interpret Grinnell from around 1870. Uh, you can see a smaller scale over the margin type flaking possibly in his finger punch account. So anyway, why over the margin? Well, when you're flaking over stone that's overhanging the margin, then uh, you have uh, the, the support becomes a fulcrum. So the blows pulling the stone away from the core and, but because it's hanging over the margin and you're holding that uh, uh, forcefully to resist the blow, uh, you, you actually have two forces that come into play. One force is pulling the flake away and the other force from the fulcrum and the support acts to, it has the same effect as if you were pulling the stone away. So that's how you get these big uh, splitting flakes that are thin. You want to have two two forces at work. One that uh, pulls the flake away from the core, and and a, and a force that pulls the core away from the flake. So this is why I'm not a fan of some of the uh, uh, the reduction models that show a break hitting a rock, and then the break runs to the support. Um, I 
okay, yeah, I I agree that in bipolar uh, bipolar reduction that that is what happens. You strike here, and that that shock runs through and to the other side, and pow, it splits in two. Yes, I agree in bipolar reduction, but if you're looking at types of flaking that involve generating either bending or something like leverage or what you get here with over the margin flaking and and you're producing these big flat flakes well i don't think it's uh, uh the the that model is fitting because that model just shows the break running to the support it doesn't show what's causing the break to run what's causing the break to run is that the flake is being pulled away from the core and vice versa the core is by virtue of the rest support is being pulled away from the flake so you have two forces at work pulling away from each other of course the brake is going to run and it's going to run really far like uh, this piece this is probably a centimeter i uh, know half an inch maybe and a half an inch it's really thin and uh this is made with the hammer stone but this, I don't believe this follows the model of the brake running to the support. So I, I believe this. there's actually two forces at work. And I think that that model may be either there's more to it than I'm aware of, or it may be an oversimplification. And I believe when you look at the Aboriginal accounts, you can actually see that the natives were using uh, sophisticated support technologies and they were cognizant of the fact that they're pulling stone apart as it breaks. So you, I mean, you actually see that with hard hammer overshot uh, that's done in hand. Uh, you, you, you torque the preform against the blow. And so you're pulling the preform away from the flake as it's detaching. You're pulling the flake away from the preform. That, over, that torquing creates an over-the-face break that will run to the other side and even go around the other side um, but it's two forces at work so this and this is actually the problem in my opinion with all of the uh, the thinking that's tool based um, like the industrial revolution our approach is uh, not so much process based as it's tool tool based a, a, a a screwdriver turns a screw, a wrench turns a bolt, a hammer, a hammer. It's very straightforward, and, and that's why it's tool-based. It's a very, uh, like, shortest distance from point A to point B. Flint napping, in my opinion, is actually more dynamic than that. And so you have to look at the whole picture with the tool being one part of the picture. One of the things that, uh, that I help me understand flaking is that in my own personal study is that you have an initiation you have a run and you have a termination okay so in a flaking process there can be some aspects of the flaking process that if exclusively affect the initiation and exclusively affects how the break starts Okay, and then there's other aspects of the flaking process that, in my opinion, affect how the brake carries. So, for example, here, the brake carry to the backside. And then there's other aspects of the flaking process that affect how the brake terminates. For example, if you have an overshot uh, flake, you're going to have a true 90-degree turn before reaching the other side. Okay, so these are three different aspects of the flaking process that are independent of the tool. So this is where this whole thinking, you know, the tool, well, that's one piece, one part of the picture, one piece of the puzzle, one part of the pie, but this is not, uh, I don't believe this can be understood in the way that we approach mechanics and the tools of mechanics in the industrial revolution. I think it's actually more dynamic and, and more complex. So anyway, that's the spiel.